Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers for putting together such a stimulating conference. And uh, uh, so today's talk will be very much introductory. Um, I don't know that we've had any uh, so far. I came in a little uh, late on Monday. But uh, as far as I know, it's been very little discussion of edge reinforced walk. So that's what I'm going to focus on. My original title was um, hyperbolic sigma models. but I think uh, that will have to wait for later. Uh, otherwise, you will not understand why I would ever consider such a strange uh, model. But that will be motivated as time goes on. Um, so, uh, so I want to begin with just the basic definitions and motivation for what's called um, uh, edge reinforced walk. And it really should be called linearly what I will refer to as edge reinforced walk sometimes. Uh, you, should, you should think of it as linearly edge reinforced walk. So this is, this is a walk which is a history dependent walk. It's got memory. It's kind of like a nostalgic walk. Uh, and the walk takes nearest neighbor steps. Um, uh, and it favors the edges, the steps it has visited in the past. So it's a, as I said, it's a kind of nostalgic walk. It was introduced by Percy Diaconis in uh, around 1986 while he was uh, wandering the streets of Paris. This is, I talked to Percy. This is uh, not just, this is what he really told me. This is, um, uh, Silky also uh, has said the same thing. And he'd like to return to streets that he had visited in the past. And so he made up this model, um, which is really uh, sort of, uh, you know, when I first learned about this model, I thought it was a pretty strange model. And in fact, I first learned about the model from, uh, from Gotti when he was visiting uh, the Institute for Advanced Study. He told me about this model. And I thought it was you know, kind of an interesting model, but a little bit unusual. But it is really, uh, it is really uh, quite, a, quite a nice model. And we'll see some connections to, to quantum mechanics and other things in sigma models in a little bit. So anyhow, um, so why, why linearly edge reinforced? Uh, and both the edge and the linear are important here. If I do a vertex reinforced jump, it's different. If I don't do linearly, I do sublinearly or, or, or superlinearly, the, 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 the phenomena change. So, so what it is, it's, uh, it's related to Paul Gilles Ern. It's related to this notion of, of, of De Finetti. It's a generalization of the De Finetti theorem, which tells you that if I have a, a sequence of uh, independent random variables, uh, which are invariant under under um, permutation, then it is a superposition of, 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 indep of independent random variables. And um, uh, so a partially exchangeable process is a notion of, of uh, uh, is a generalization of this notion of De Finetti, where you have, uh, where you can replace um, things by a superposition of independent random variables. But these are uh, a superposition of Markov processes. So the process, of course, is not Markovian because you remember where you were in the past. Uh, uh, but it will be seen to be equivalent to a, um, a random walk in a random environment. And we have to average over the environment. So there'll be some discussion over this. Now let me give you the proper definition. What is the definition of the, and this is linearly, linearly edge reinforced random walk. Okay, So you have at every edge, and edge by, by edge, I'll mean nearest neighbor edges. One could consider much more general. You can take other edges on some random, on, on some graph, or whatever you want to do. So you have a little counter there that counts the number of times you cross uh, an edge. And you can cross it, you know, there's no orientation, so you can cross it either way you like. Um, and, um, and we have a parameter beta. Um, here it is. I've put it in red to emphasize it. And uh, beta uh, will have to do with the strength of the reinforcement. So if beta is very large, um, I'm calling it beta for a reason. And I'll come back to it in a second. But uh, if, beta's, um, if beta is very large, it will have to do with what's called uh, a weak reinforcement. And if beta is small, it will be um, strong reinforcement. So here it is. If I want to go from uh, at time n, I'm at site j on my lattice. And I'm going to go to a nearest neighbor site. I want to compute the probability of that happening. 
So I just, I just weight this thing by one, uh, and then I count the number of times I've visited, um, uh, I, I've visited this particular edge in the past. I, maybe no, I may have never have visited it in the past, uh, so that could be zero. But if it's, if it's very large compared to other sites, you're more likely to take this. So this is a, this is a factor which tells you what the rate of hopping is from here to here. And this is just a normalization. And J and K are, again, uh, just nearest neighbors on my lattice. So, um, so if I come to a, let me just, just to make sure, because it's important to understand at least the definition of this. And so um, if you have questions, let me, let me just say it like this. Uh, here I, oops, yes, I have a, my, I'm going to draw this in two dimensions. Here I am. I have a counter which has counted the number of times I've visited this edge, maybe zero, maybe several times. And I have a counter for all these. Now, if these are all equally weighted, all they've visited the, these edges the same number of times, then it's just, I pick one of them at random. But if this one, for example, has been visited more often, or this one has been visited more often, then you would take, more likely to take that one by this linear reinforcement. So if beta is very, very big, um, then you see the number of times that you, that it has crossed a particular edge is somewhat suppressed by a factor of beta when beta is big. Uh, if beta is small, then, uh, then, then it will be important, uh, it would be quite important how many times I've crossed those edges and what the relative strength is. So, uh, so this is just a normalization. Um, and uh, as I said, beta small means this is, this is important. And uh, beta large means this is less important. And the beta will correspond in statistical mechanics, if you, those of you who know things like Ising models and so forth, the beta will correspond to temperature, or the inverse temperature more precisely. So this will, so if beta is small, we call it high temperature, um, because beta is the inverse temperature usually. Uh, and, uh, and if beta is large, this is low temperature. Now, in statistical mechanics, high temperature is usually much easier to understand than low temperature. Um, uh, and, um, and so uh, strong, uh, so, so, so weak reinforcement turns out to be, um, it turns out to be a, a kind of perturbation theory, uh, perturbation of ordinary random walk, but it's a non-trivial perturbation. And, and uh, so this will, be the more, uh, this will be the more challenging case to understand. So before I go on, are there any, any questions you want about the definition, what, what I mean by edge reinforced walk? So, uh, so there is a kind of, I would say, you see, if your walk has been, it starts over here somewhere, and maybe it's, it's explored this, um, uh, this vertex for the first time, but it, it hasn't, it's been here, but not here or here or here, then these have less weight, a little bit less weight um, than this one does. And so you're a little bit more likely to, to choose uh, this one than, than the others. And so there's kind of a drift back toward, your, toward the origin. So this has a kind of drift. Uh, if you start at the origin and you move out, you're more likely to sort of favor where you were before and rather than explore new territory. So that's, that's an, sort of an intuitive way that I sometimes like to think about. It. OK, so what do we want to understand? We, well, of course, uh, we define a walk. We want to understand the, the long time asymptotics. Um, so the first basic question, is the edge reinforced walk, uh, linearly edge reinforced walk from now on, uh, uh, recurrent? Does it you know, come back to the starting point uh, infinitely often? Uh, is it localized? Um, now, I'm going to use the notion of localization. Um, the notion of localization, I, I don't know whether it's used in probability so much, but it's certainly used in, um, in the theory of Anderson localization. And these are very analogous uh, uh, notions. Um, so you start at, at, at some point here at the origin, let's say, and you ask for the probability of how far you have moved after time n um, from uh, the, the origin. And you ask for the probability. The probability will, of course, depend upon the beta, the, the reinforcement that you have in your system. And if the probability that you go very far is suppressed by an exponential amount, we will sometimes call that exponential localization. And there's a parameter here, L, which depends upon beta, and this is called the localization length. So this is roughly speaking how far the process goes before it wants to sort of revisit where it was. So clearly localization is a strong notion. Uh, ordinary random walk, as we know in two dimensions, is always 
um, is a recurrent uh, in two dimensions. But this, this property here certainly fails for, for, for ordinary random walk. Uh, but it might be true, and we'll see it is true, uh, for uh, edge reinforced walk in, under certain circumstances. The other question is whether it's transient. Uh, so one can ask that question. Um, and, that, and, uh, and is it diffusive? So, so then these things will not be uh, valid anymore. So these are kind of opposite regimes. And of course, you're, there are all kinds of other possibilities for the, the time evolution, which I haven't put down. But the, one of the questions that we'll focus on is, is there a phase transition as we vary the reinforcement? So you could imagine that, um, and this is what will happen in three dimensions, for beta small, uh, in three dimensions, you will be localized. In other words, you're very, um, you're very much attracted to where you were before. You're very nostalgic. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then if you make uh, a beta uh, very large, and if you have weak reinforcement, then, uh, then, then all of a sudden you, uh, you'll move away sort of diffusively. And, uh, and, and as you, then there'll be a critical beta, which will mark the barrier between uh, localization and maybe diffusion. And that would, be, uh, that would be the analog of a phase transition. And beta critical would be the analog of a phase transition. For example, an icing model, where you go from high temperature, where things are disordered, to low temperature, where things are more or less ordered. OK, so those are the questions we'd like to address. So, uh, so let me go back to uh, what Percy was uh, thinking about. So he understood this, this, this process uh, was exchangeable. He knew it was an interesting process because, uh, because of the fact that it could be written as a, a superposition, uh, as a random walk in a random environment. And, uh, and then uh, I think around the same time, uh, he, he, uh, he explained to me that he worked with uh, Don Coppersmith, who was at Bell Labs. Um, and, uh, and together, uh, they found, so, so the environment, it means, what is the, so you have random, uh, uh, a random environment means that I have weights which are, which the rates at which uh, an edge, JJ prime, is crossed. So I'll call that W, so just a weight. Um, and these are fairly complicated correlated random variables. So usually, if you talk about random walk in a random environment, you imagine these are IID, uh, maybe uniformly elliptic. Um, this is not true in this thing. They are not IID. They are highly correlated random variables. And so this is the environment which you have to average over to, in order to understand what edge reinforced walk is. So, uh, so there's a distribution on these, um, on these uh, local conductances. Um, uh, so they are actually not even translation invariant. Once you start the, once you start the, the walk at some point, um, the, uh, the, the law for these guys will depend upon the initial point. And that's kind of an important thing. But what they did, what, what uh, Don Coppersmith and, uh, and uh, Percy Diaconis did, is they found an explicit joint distribution for, um, for these, uh, these random conductances. Okay. So, they, so they tell you exactly what they look like, um, except this, actually paper, this paper was actually never published. I mean, this is a famous very famous paper, which was never published. I think one of the few people who, uh, uh, and I, I, as far as I know, uh, Sophie, you can correct me, there's no proof in, there, in this, this little note. Is that correct? There, there, is, a there is a proof in the, in the notes. OK. They do, they do that. OK. OK, thanks. You. So, so she was one of the first people to understand the significance of this. And, uh, and started making uh, important contributions to this uh, area. But there's an explicit formula. The formula, I'm not even going to write it down. It's fairly complicated. Um, uh, and uh, it, it wouldn't be very helpful except to say that it's a couple of things about it. It's quite non-local. Uh, things are highly correlated. Um, and uh, it involves sums over trees and so forth. Okay? Uh, or it, it involves determinants of, of various Laplacians. So, um, so, it, so this joint distribution, uh, in spite of the fact that you have an explicit um, uh, formula for it, it's a, it's a statistical mechanical system. I mean, and it's, it's not one of your usual ones that you're uh, uh, used to looking at, because it doesn't look like an icing model. It doesn't look like a, uh, an XY model, or any of the standard ones that one, one's uh, expected to see. And uh, so, so this is not an easy one to work with. And, um, and so, as I said, this is, a, this is a complicated statistical mechanical model. There are much more complicated ones, I should say. But, um, 
but one, th one, one thing that you can do, and they, they understand, is that you can explicitly compute the partition function. And, uh, and as a random walk in a random environment, this, this random walk is, um, I would say, uh, of divergence form. So that's nice. So that you have a nice self-adjoint operator. And, uh, and when I um, uh, was talking to Percy about this a while ago, he said, yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, actually Sophie was one of the first people to, to notice that it was of divergence form. That helps a lot in understanding what goes on. So, so we have a formula for the environment, which I'm not going to write down. It won't help you uh, uh, understand things anyhow. But, but one of the interesting features is that you can explicitly compute the partition function. You can't compute correlations, but you can explicitly compute partition function. And by the way, this is very reminiscent, um, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about supersymmetry, many models with, which are supersymmetric um, you can write the partition function down um, explicitly, and, and, but that doesn't tell you much. <laughs> it, you, have to, you have to break the supersymmetry before you get information about the system. So there is already a little hint of some connection here. So the, I'm just going to write down the generator for the random walk. It's, it's of course, as a uh, quadratic form. It's, it's a weighted Laplacian. Um, here it is. And uh, if I take any arbitrary vector and I dot product with the transpose, I will get um, the gradient squared, as I usually do for a Laplacian on the lattice. And here are my uh, weighted conductances. These are, this is not, if these were all one, this would be your ordinary Laplacian on the lattice. But these, these guys are, are random, and they can become very small, and they can become very large. Okay? So it's not uniformly elliptic in a strict sense. Now, if you knew that the Ws who are very unlikely to be very large or very unlikely to be very small, then you might guess reasonably that this is effectively elliptic and it look, would look like a random walk, but, uh, but it's not obvious what the distribution with these guys is. So, so, uh, so as I mentioned before, it's uh, the, the distribution of these guys will depend upon the starting point of the walk, and that will be important. So, so now what we have is a random walk in a random environment. I've described the fact that, that these guys are not simple, but they have an explicit um, formula. And uh, so let me see what I have next here on this thing. OK, so now, so that's a little bit of the background of edge reinforced walk. In, in a little while, I'll be coming to uh, a slightly different topic. But let me just review some of the, um, some of the results that were known um, uh, uh, using um, Using these, uh, using what this kind of calls a magic formula, which is the, the joint distribution of the of these guys. So, so the first, I think, some of the first results were obtained by uh, Robin P. Mantle, who analyzed the edge reinforced walk on a regular tree, and he showed that it has a sharp transition uh, on the tree. I mean, the tree can't be aligned, but it, it, it can, if it's a real tree, uh, then uh, it has a sharp transition, which means there's a special beta. Um, and if your beta is larger than this special critical beta, then you have um, uh, uh, transients. And if it's smaller than that, you have recurrence. So that's what we mean. So this is a sharp transition. And I think he actually can compute it, more or less. Uh, one thing, one question which I've, I've never really looked at this uh, analysis, but I, one question I've been asking some people is whether uh, on this, um, uh, on, on these trees, uh, you know beta critical explicitly. Do you actually know what happens right at beta critical? I mean, does, is there something interesting on the tree that happens right at beta critical which hasn't really been looked at carefully? So the edge reinforced walk and the, some of these other models have very, very interesting transitions from localized to maybe diffusive. Okay? And I don't know whether some of this interesting feature will already uh, still persist on the tree. But I think uh, somebody who's uh, knowledgeable about these things can, can settle that question. Um, in, uh, in, uh, if, if one looks at what one believes is a sharp transition, in, let's say, in, in, on a three-dimensional lattice, uh, these models are, um, have a very complicated transition uh, from localized to delocalized. They're called, they're, they're different from um, a transition you would know like for percolation, for icing. They are multi, what are called multifractal. And uh, so that means various exponents uh, are not, you don't have just one exponent, you have a family of exponents. So 
so I will uh, just mention that. So, so this is one of the first results. I think he was a student of, uh, of Percy's. And then Merkel and Roll studied one-dimensional um, strips. By a strip, I mean that uh, you're not just looking at on the line, but you may have something where your lattice uh, is uh, with W. So let me just try to draw a picture. This is, this is actually a very interesting thing to analyze. So you have a strip here with, with the usual nearest neighbor connections. So here's my strip. So it's infinite in one direction, and it has, let's say, uh, if I go this way, it has a width w, OK? And you start your random walk, and you have um, uh, some beta. And what they show is that, uh, that, that they prove that the conductance, if you start at the origin, here, let's say this is the origin, OK? Now remember, the conductance is a random, is a random parameter. Um, and, uh, and they show that actually some fractional power of the conductance. And it's important to choose the right, right power. They, choose, they show that what happens if I start here at the origin, and I look at these, uh, I have random conductances uh, according to this joint distribution. They, now, the, the conductance around here will be of order one. But as you move away from the origin, they basically prove that uh, in, in one dimension, the uh, conductance uh, goes to zero, and you get localized. Um, uh, you get localized, let's see here, here, where it is. The localization length is of order beta, which is uh, uh, times the width of the, and this is pretty sharp. I mean, we believe this is pretty accurate. Uh, so it's a very nice argument, very similar to what's used in statistical mechanics, not for icing, because that wouldn't be correct for icing. You compute uh, what happens in icing, of course, you'll still have, a, you'll still ha have exponential decay, but it will be like beta times e to the w, not, not w. So, so this, is, this is typical of what happens of systems where you have a continuous symmetry, like an xy model. We have a u1 symmetry or, or a Heisenberg model. Uh, this is fairly uh, typical. So they produce, so in two dimensions, um, they have a, 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 the same kind of argument, which is a, I would call a Merman-Wagner type argument, but it's not, your, not quite standard, so it, it's very, I was, very uh, taken with it when I first, uh, when uh, Silky Rolls explained it to us uh, many years ago in Cambridge. Um, uh, and so this is done by a, a deformation argument. So in two dimensions, what, you, what they can prove is that some fractional power of the, conduct, of the local conductance uh, vanishes, but very slowly with a polynomial rate as you go to infinity. So for those of you who know, like the XY model, the spin-spin correlations can never order there, and they go to zero very slowly as, uh, for large beta. And so that's the, uh, uh, and so, uh, then there's this is very recent work, which um, I hope to hear a little bit more about, and I don't have so much time to, left, but uh, this, is a, this is work uh, which I think uses the Merkel Rolls result. This is, this, is, this is around 2008, 2009. And this is quite recent, and, and for the first time, uh, it was shown that the edge in 2D, edge reinforced random walk, is recurrent for any value of beta, okay. any value of beta. So, so, uh, so in that sense, it looks a little bit like, um, uh, it looks a little bit like uh, uh, ordinary uh, random walk, which of course is recurrent. But uh, there's a big conjecture here, and I consider this one of the biggest conjectures in the field. And, uh, and I'll explain why, uh, a little bit, why it's important. Because it appears every, where, everywhere in certain two-dimensional models. Um, and it's been wide open for all these models. So, th so the conjecture in this context is that the walk is exponentially localized for all beta. Okay? So, so no matter how weak I wake, make the reinforcement, um, the probability of the path going really super far out is exponentially suppressed. Okay? So that's what we mean by, by localization in the sense of, uh, 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 in this exponential sense. You can be suppressed, but you really want to know that it's exponentially suppressed. And this is a feature which is shared, uh, by the way, in random Schrodinger, in two-dimensional random Schrodinger. It's, it's shared by what's called the quantum Heisenberg, the classical Heisenberg, where your spins lie on the sphere. It's not shared by the XY model, which, in which they lie in a circle. And it's certainly not true for uh, things like icing. So it's a different kind of, it's a different universality class. And uh, it's certainly extremely interesting to understand this question. It's open in many contexts, not just here. My guess is that this is, this, this is probably the best chance we have of actually proving something like this. It may be the, the best model to, to analyze such questions. 
So, so those are some of the results uh, before we get to the statistical mechanics. Now, now I will go to uh, where, where I come from, um, which is the, uh, a model of a quantum particle on, on a lattice uh, scattered by random impurities, the so-called Anderson tight binding model. Um, and here you have a Hamiltonian. This is a this is discrete Laplacian on your lattice, a ZD. And you have, uh, you're multiplying this by, this is a multiplication operator, by a random potential. And uh, these are typically taken to be IIDs. And if lambda is very small, uh, that means you have a weak disorder. And so, um, so this, this model is still widely studied. Uh, they're still extremely simple to write down. Uh, uh, and now, what do we want to know about this, about this model? We want to understand the eigenstates. So as I take the infinite volume limit, I'm on ZD. This, this acts on little l2. Sequences indexed by ZD, which are in a square integral. This is a nice self-adjoint operator on there. And with probability one, you can ask questions about what the eigenstates look like. You can ask for the time evolution, average time evolution. But by, by time evolution, I mean real time evolution. Not, I'm not talking about, so I'm talking really more about uh, time evolution of the following kind. Um, so I would have, uh, so I would have e to the i t h. So it's a real time evolution with all, all kinds of oscillations in it. And we would like to know if I have a, 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 an initial wave packet that starts, let's say, near the origin, and I let it evolve via this uh, time evolution. So that means I'm le letting this wave packet try to spread out, but it gets scattered by impurities. Uh, and these are the impurities in the system. That's why people study these things. These, this, this model was first proposed and by Anderson. And so you want to know what the eigenstates look like, and you know, want to know how this wave packet spreads. Okay? So if I don't have any randomness, it will spread like a, like a wave. It will just move out sort of linearly. But with the randomness present, um, that will scatter the, the wave. And, uh, and we believe, uh, there's no theorem, unfortunately, we believe that this wave, uh, if, if, the, uh, if the coupling constant is weak enough, will not scatter linearly, but will, will scatter diffusively. It'll have a diffusive behavior. And um, so, so localization uh, will actually mean that you have eigenstates here, which are dense, and uh, they decay exponentially fast. They don't, the, the eigenstates don't look uh, like plane waves at all. They look like, um, they look like, uh, they look like what we call localized states, so your eigenstates might look like this. Of course, they can have sign fluctuations, but out here, so here's the center of, uh, of, the, uh, of an eigenstate, so I call some eigenstate psi, 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 uh, psi alpha j. This is my j-axis. So here's the center of it, and it might decay like that. Uh, it would, of course, ha have oscillations inside, uh, but the point is it would decay outside. So let me give you, uh, just before I, so localization means, oops, let me go back to this. Localization means that, um, uh, that your eigenfunctions decay about some center, and that means in physical terms that you have enough uh, impurities in your system so that it, the wave packet doesn't spread at all. It really goes out for a certain distance and then doesn't go. And that's what's called an insulator uh, because you can't conduct. And so if you have diffusion, uh, which you may also have, then of course you have some kind con of conductivity. So, so this, let me just mention one thing about this uh, model. Um, uh, so maybe I'll go over, over here. Um, so let's, let's, for those of you who are not familiar with localization, uh, uh, I was first explained this, about this picture by Yasha Sinai many, many years ago, and I was very uh, surprised by it. So let's look at one dimension. And we take, uh, you know, Laplacian plus um, this lambda v. And we'll suppose vj's, and these are independent random variables. Let's say uniformly distributed between minus one and one. I'm on the lattice. So here's, here's, my, here's my system. Um, I'm, on, I'm on the lattice, so I have these points here. And let's say I, I, take, a, I take a little uh, wave packet and I, I try to propagate it out here. So I, send a, I try to send a plane wave through the system like this. So what happens if I try to do that is that the localization will tell me that no matter how small lambda is, although that, that wave which I tried to propagate through here will all get reflected back. 
So you'll never go, the wave will never travel very far. It will always just reflect back and back and forth. And so it'll just sort of run back and forth in your system. So that's, this is a, this is a theorem due to uh, Goldscheid, Maltanov, and Pasteur. Uh, it was based on some uh, early work of, of uh, Gersenberg on products of uh, random matrices. So this is, this is a very striking thing because you see, if I don't have this or if I have a periodic potential or I have something else, then there will be some waves that get through. But with a random one, they never pass through. They all get reflected back. So that's a little bit of the intuition. Now this a model, as simple as it looks, is still, still quite complicated. So, so strangely enough, uh, you know, people like uh, Franz Wegener, a very famous physicist, uh, around 1980, he said, well, look, I, I want to understand this model. I'd like to understand what happens in two dimensions particularly. That's the question there. And uh, so he developed what's called a hyperbolic uh, sigma model. And this is a model with hyperbolic symmetry, which I'll describe in a minute. And, uh, and then he made an equivalent. Now, the equivalent here shouldn't be taken too literally. Uh, this is uh, equivalent through what's called replicas. It's not a, rigorous, uh, not a rigorous duality. But he had very deep ideas about how you could apply statistical mechanics to problems like this. And then later, later on, uh, Konstantin Efetov realized that you could do what Wegener did rigorously. You could write a statistical mechanical system down, which was rigorously equivalent to, um, uh, to, to problems of understanding uh, transport and uh, eigenfunctions and so forth. And you could write this down in terms of a very complicated uh, statistical mechanical model. So let me just say what this, what this U11-2 is. I won't probably say much about, more about it. 1-1 uh, stands for a hyperbolic symmetry uh, in the, what are called the bosonic fields. And there are uh, Grassmann variables, which means there are anti-commuting variables or fermions in the system. And they have an SU2 symmetry. So this is a hyperbolic symmetry coupled with, a, with an SU2 symmetry uh, supersymmetrically. So your spins are now matrices with Grassmann variables and ordinary complex variables in them. Uh, so, uh, and then you, there are notions of supertraces and so forth. But it's a rigorous, it's a rigorous equivalence. Um, I think one can do something with this in one dimension. And people are working on that. In the, high, in, the, in the sigma model, one can do things. But in higher dimensions, this looks very, very complicated. So, so the fact that you have a rigorous equivalence is very nice. But if, you, if, the, if the system's too complicated to analyze, then, then you can ask, well, uh, why, would I, why would I look at it? Uh, you can try. But what, what Martin Zirnbauer realized around 1991 is he found a simpler version of this Efetov uh, sigma model. And this is sometimes called the su supersymmetric hyperbolic sigma model. And, and here, this, the, there's two, uh, two twos here. Uh, the first two is for the dimension of hyperbolic space. So your spins are like a vector. And part of the vector takes values in hyperbolic space. I'll come back to that. And the other two takes values in a, a space of, of Grassmann variables. And these are non-commuting variables, which you will never see me put down on this board, OK? <laughs> because I know most of you are not familiar with it. But it's an extremely convenient way to understand uh, these supersymmetric systems. In the end, we always integrate out. We trace out the Grassmann variables. And th when you trace it out, this will give you determinants, because they're related to determinants. And these determinants are related to sums over tree, over spanning trees. And so, so, so then you can write everything in, 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 that, in that language, if you like. So in 1D, what, what Martin did is he proved localization in this model. Um, of course, 1D was known by, by, uh, uh, by other means, um, that this was always localized. But he did it in this context, and um, he used some kind of non-abelian Fourier analysis to analyze and prove localization. And he could prove uh, exponential decay of correlations for all beta. So that's like localization. Uh, so in any dimension, um, spin correlations of this H22 model, um, if you write it in the correct variables, it has to be written in what are called uh, horospherical coordinates, which I may get a chance to talk about. Uh, it can be always written as random walk in a random environment. So this supersymmetric system, uh, which sounds like something you would never want to look at, can is equivalent to a, a random walk in a random environment. So that starts to become the connection. Yes, hi. So, <laughs> so you said it's a simplified version. But it still implies understanding the localization, and this one still implies something. Of the, no, it, it implies, yeah. implies nothing about the original 
a quantum model, okay? It implies nothing about the original quantum model. And so, of course, it's a toy model. Uh, it's a simplified model. Uh, but um, uh, nevertheless, it is um, very instructive because uh, the part of the problem with understanding localization is that there's memory. So let me go back to, let me make a point here, if I could. If this V here were time independent at different times in space, you know, so I have a spatial randomness and I have a time randomness, then the problem is trivial, okay? Because it's basically a Markov process. This is highly non-Markovian, okay? So to understand, uh, for example, walks with memory is a step in understanding highly non-Markovian processes. And this is, this is certainly one of them. When, you're, when there's no time dependence, that's where, that's where localization, delocalization can occur. And, uh, but if you have a time-dependent system, and there's some systems which you can imagine have that form, then the problem becomes much, much easier, and you can prove that there's no transition. You always get diffusion. You have a quantum diffusion uh, process always. So, so this has to do with the notion of memory it becomes very important here uh, in quantum mechanics as well as in uh, ordinary random walks. So, so, yes, so this, to, to answer uh, uh, the question, the, uh, the point is that uh, this model doesn't really tell you, I mean, it's interesting, uh, it's instructive, but, um, and it's a step in the right direction, but if you ask, well, if I take a random matrix ensemble, uh, you know, I take a, a band matrix, random Schrodinger, does this, have, does, it, does this have, you know, implications for that? The answer is no. However, what is quite amazing is that qualitatively, the, the theory of this sigma model and the theory of random Schrodinger or, or random band matrices is believed to have the same qualitative features. Okay? But that's, that's a belief, that's not a theorem. And, but, but everything points to, to this model being very much closely related to this in any dimension, okay? any dimension. But what, of course, this is related to, as we'll see, is, is related to edge reinforced walk. So that's why I, I have it here. So, okay, so in any dimensions, it can be expressed as a random walk in a random environment. Um, okay, so there's a theorem here, which I won't dwell on. Uh, maybe Margarita will say more. She talks right after me. Uh, is that this model has a phase transition. As you vary your beta, it has a phase transition in three dimensions. And that means you will go from, um, for, for strong reinforcement, you'll be localized. And for large reinforcement, you'll have some kind of uh, 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 transience and uh, some kind of diffusion. So what is the relationship between this H22 model and edge reinforced walk? Um, so this, this was a question which um, uh, I guess uh, we knew there was some connection between these things because Gadi and other people had pointed out a connection between what we were trying to do and, uh, and what, uh, what uh, Diaconis and and the coppersmith had done, he looked at the, I had shown him some early work we were trying to understand this H22 model at the time when he was visiting. And he said, you know, this looks a little bit like, the, like, like this edge reinforced walk. And I could not believe that there was any connection. But of course there is. And here's the connection. This, uh, this is surprising work where Sabo and Taras found a precise connection between the H22 model and edge reinforced walk and also what's called uh, uh, the, uh, uh, vertex reinforced jump process. Okay, um, so so that's something that Margarita will talk about. So there is a very there's a very tight connection, and if you understand something about this, you will learn something about uh, the uh, vertex reinforced jump process, or you will learn something about the edge reinforced walk. So it's not quite an equivalence here, but it's closer to what's called the the jump process. So it made it possible. This this work made it possible to prove phase transitions for edge reinforced walk. Uh, it doesn't follow directly from this, but um, uh, all these authors uh, combined together uh, made, uh, made excellent progress in understanding edge reinforced walk and showing it has transitions. There's also uh, very insightful work of, uh, of, of these authors, which, uh, uh, which don't actually have to use the exact formula of the given by uh, others. Okay, so now we come time for sigma models, which is barely have enough time to to get here. So what are sigma models? Well, uh, OK, so, uh, so you, you all probably know something about the icing model, you know, where you have splins pointing up and down. Uh, and you can take a nearest neighbor model. You can take a next to nearest neighbor model. Um, these are all uh, icing models. Um, so your spins 
take values in some symmetric space. Now, my symmetric space is a pretty trivial one. It's just a, it's just a Z2, okay? And that's the Ising model. Um, so, uh, so, there, so, so then there's another one which is a little bit more complicated, which would be the uh, XY model. It's actually quite a bit different. It has a different character to it. It has a U1 symmetry, so I can take all my spins and rotate them simultaneously. Uh, and if I have no magnetic field, I don't change my energy. The energy is invariant under the U1 action. So these are, these are all symmetric spaces of some kind or other. The other one that's very interesting and, and much harder to analyze, so this is reasonably well understood in two dimensions. Uh, this one is not. This is a classical Heisenberg model. Here the spins belong to the unit sphere. Okay? Instead of the, instead of the, uh, uh, in, instead of the um, circle, you take the dot product, you know, your interaction, you have Si, Sj, um, and now you take the dot product, these are vectors, of course, and, and you take the dot product and you look at the nearest neighbor uh, model, and that's your classical Heisenberg model. Now this model is quite a lot, you know, qualitatively, um, quite a lot like the uh, edge reinforced walk. Not exactly the same, but it has some of the same features, which, uh, uh, and there are open questions about this. This is a big, this is a big problem because you have a non-abelian symmetry that works in here. So this is, this is a homogeneous space. It's uh, SU2 over U1, and, um, and then we have the hyperbolic sigma model, uh, which I will describe, and then we have the supersymmetric one, and then we have the Efetov model, which I vaguely referred to, which is, so this is a kind of hierarchy of, of, um, of difficulty. Actually, the hyperbolic sigma model is perhaps the easiest of all of them, and I will talk about that. So this is, this is actually not a strict hierarchy in, current, in terms of difficulty. Um, this one is quite, uh, it's much more manageable, it has no supersymmetry in it, and actually it will have no phase transition, at least in three dimensions. So, so these are the different, um, and your usual energy is, uh, you take the energy, you take the difference of the spins at, at neighboring sites, you take the square, and then you may add in a little magnetic field, which will break the symmetry. Uh, and these are adjacent vertices. Um, and this, the dot product here is used in the symmetric space. So the, uh, the dot products and energies are measured in the metric of your, of your target space. Um, so if, you, if I have a, uh, if I have a um, icing model, I use, just use, use the Euclidean distance. But if I have a hyperbolic symmetry, I use a hyperbolic distance. Um, yes, uh, well, um, yes, there's a, there's, a, there's a metric for that, too. <laughs> okay. so, so here's my partition function. Here's where the beta enters, right? Um, and you have your energy, and you integrate now. If you're summing Ising model, you're just summing over plus or minus ones. Otherwise, you have to integrate over the sphere or the circle or um, the hyperbolic uh, paraboloid that I'll discuss in a second. And beta is your inverse temperature, and here's your spin-spin correlation. You just read it like that. So this is the usual system you're looking at. It's just that I have sort of a larger class of spins that you're looking at, and there and these spins, uh, the, the symmetry of these spins is all important. So we believe that icing model and something like a five-fourth model, or if the five-fourth is a scalar, they look very different, but they'll have the same phenomenology because the symmetries are the same. So, so these sigma models are somehow the, the basic models which you try to understand uh, the physics for. They're the simplest models, but they're the basic models. Okay, so uh, here, uh, yeah, if you're at low temperature, what will mean the, the spins try to align? Um, and i uh, and, uh, just make a little comment here that this, this uh, representation in terms of, of path integrals for these things is very important for uh, understanding Wigner-Dyson theory. You can understand that uh, that, that the reason you have some kind of universality of Wigner Dyson is the same saddle manifold appears in, uh, in, in many systems. So uh, I won't go into that, I won't have time to say. Now here's the hyperbolic sigma model. Just at the very end, I'm gonna write it down for you. Um, and, uh, and then I'll stop a little, maybe I'll stop a little early. Uh, so here's my spin, it has three components. Now if these were all pluses, I would be talking about the sphere. These, Spins would lie on the sphere, but I have, a, I have pluses and I have minuses. That's the indefinite signature, hyperbolic symmetry. And I, my dot product here is with respect to the natural metric um, given by this uh, signature here. 
and this, this is the integral that we want to do. So the spins actually, the spins are, are really belong to a kind of hyperboloid, and we're integrating over the positive parts of this hyperboloid. So if I write z, you can write z is equal to the square root of x, uh, uh, x squared plus y squared plus one, uh, and I would always be taking the positive one. So here, here's, here's the interaction, and, uh, and this is the measure over the high, natural measure on the hyperboloid. And if epsilon is equal to zero, this integral blows up, but it has a nice symmetry under, under this uh, 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 U11 uh, group. Uh, but it ha you have to put a regularization in here to make this integral well-defined. And so that's my partition function. It's a little strange, but uh, it's, we'll see this is exactly a random walk in a random environment. So that we first understood it in this case. Uh, and so you can use the xy coordinates, but they're very, not very insightful. One of the key points in, in understanding some of these sigma models, particularly the hyperbolic ones, is to make a change of coordinates. This is a very simple thing. Actually, it's not so simple. I mean, I, when I first saw this coordinate change, I was kind of, I was very surprised that such a thing existed. Geometers probably know these things. and and Martin Zirnbauer is, as well as being an excellent physicist, he's also an excellent geometer. He knows his geometry very well, which I do not. Uh, so he showed me these coordinate systems. And then when you write this expression here, in terms of these coordinate systems, so you can check, it's a little exercise, to check that if I let x, uh, z, x, and y uh, behave like this, it will obey this relation. It will always obey this relation. So this is a parameterization of the, of the hyperbolic target. And what's, what's, what's extraordinary about it is that you have something which is purely quadratic in the S's. So you, have, so you see I have two coordinates here. I have S and T. They're real variables. And this is a Gaussian integral in the S's. So this is Gaussian here, and there's a Gaussian piece in here. So this looks like, if you, look, if you stare at this for a minute, you'll see that if I uh, if I freeze the t's and integrate out the s's, I'm looking at a random walk in a random environment. And this is my environment, the t's. So that's, that's really the point. So the generator of this uh, random walk in a random environment will be given by the t's. There'll be a little killing factor. And this will be a, a, a finite difference elliptic operator, but it will not be uniformly elliptic. And um, so if the t's were all zero, then this would be just the ordinary Laplacian. Okay. So this is a local conductance. And now we get back very close to what, uh, what, what Percy and uh, uh, um, uh, Coppersmith, uh, Don Coppersmith did, except that the weights are not the same. They're not the same for this one. So this is, these are not the right weights. But it is nevertheless a random walk in a random environment. And uh, so, so then when you want to compute correlations, um, you can integrate out the, the, the S's because they're quadratic. You get a determinant. Uh, now, the determinant has a plus sign here in the case that uh, Diaconis looks at, there's a minus sign instead. And that's where you need the supersymmetry to change, to flip that sign from plus to minus. You've got Grassmann variables, which will give you a determinant of the opposite uh, uh, sign, and it will flip this plus to minus. So here's a spin spin correlation. You look at y at 0, y at x. You can write it in terms of these horospherical spherical coordinates. And then this will be. Uh, actually equal to the Green's function of this random, uh, of this uh, uh, diffusion matrix uh, with, a, with a factor out here, and, um, and that's, that's the connection. Spin-spin correlations can be written as an average of this operator, which is, uh, this is a differential operator with a, with a uh, random conductance. So that's, that's very, very briefly how you go from hyperbolic models um, to a random conductance. And, and the point is that you need these horospherical coordinates. If you use polar coordinates, you'll never see this. It's, I mean, at least I would never see it. Maybe one can, one can do it that way. But it's much, this is much more transparent what goes on. And the point is, just to uh, make it once again, is that when you have the, when you write it in this action, you have quadratic, one of the fields is complicated. That's the T field. But the S fields are Gaussian. And you can express many correlations purely in S's, and therefore you have random walk in a random environment. OK, so, uh, 
So there's a formal symmetry here for those of you who know about gradient models. This is a gradient model. It's a very non-local gradient model. Uh, so gradient models means I have gradients of t. So if I shift t by any constant, then the, the, the energy, the effective energy remains the same. So it is a, it is a kind of a, a, a walk. It is convex. So in three dimensions, uh, around 2000, I think 2004, uh, uh, Martin and I proved that in three dimensions, for all beta and epsilon, the hyperbolic symmetry only has diffusive behavior in 3D. I don't know what happens in 2D, by the way. Uh, there's no disordered phase. Uh, we use two things. This is convex, so this, that's now obvious. And we have uniform bounds on the local conductance, and this enables us to get uh, all kinds of information. So this, is this gives you diffusive behavior, and uh, there's a random walk in this environment. So this is not the model. Okay? So, uh, and in fact, we were disappointed that it had no phase transition. Um, and uh, so it took a while later uh, to realize that Martin had another model. This is this H22 model. This has no supersymmetry in it, but it has no transition. And it all convex. So there's nothing that can happen that's really exciting in three dimensions. I don't know what happens, in, by the way, in two dimensions. It's, there, I think there are probably interesting questions there. So we did not look into that. Uh, so the hyperbolic symmetry, it doesn't do very much for you. Uh, it, it just, it, the model is very similar, except I used to have a plus sign here, and now I have a minus sign. Okay? It's about all it does. Now, miraculously, there's some other little minute sign changes you have to, to make uh, in your Jacobian. But, but now, it's, it's, it's remarkable that the partition function for this system is exactly one, if you normalize things correctly. So you can compute the partition function in the supersymmetric model exactly. You can't do that in the other models. Uh, so, so that was all nice, but the, what's, the, what's the difficult part about this is that the signs here are, are competing. And so you do not have a uniform elliptic system. And uh, you do not have a hyperbolic system. Uh, sorry, you do, not have a, um, uh, you do not have a convex system. The other one was convex after I integrated out the s's. So this problem, you have a competition between order, and this is a disordered term, which is not local. And your spin-spin correlation looks very much the same, as I wrote down. But as I said, it's not convex, and there is a phase transition. So this is the model, now that I'm, I think my time is up or past. Uh, this is the model on which um, the uh, edge-reinforced walk is based. And as I said, it, What's remarkable about it, in, in retrospect, is that we were motivated by, uh, motivated by, uh, purely by um, uh, un trying to understand a quantum problem. And uh, we couldn't solve the quantum problem, of course. It doesn't solve the quantum problem. But it certainly helps to understand this uh, edge-reinforced work. So uh, I think I will stop there. Thank you very much.